I hope you can see the circuit drawing here because my camera setup is still essentially just tying my camera to my lamp. So I really need to fix something with that. Also this first bit is recorded after I've completed the project. But I thought I would go through my schematics and also answer a question or two that I received. So let's start with the heart of the thing, the microcontroller. And I'm using the AT Tiny 804, which is one of the modern AT Tiny series uh, microcontrollers. And uh, this one has 8 kilobytes of flash. First thing is that uh, we get the battery power in, and uh, then very close to the AT Tiny should be a 0.1 microfarad capacitor to filter out noise. Because essentially, you may get electrical noise if uh, something draws a lot of power, like uh, it does a spike, or even from external sources. And then having uh, a capacitor on that uh, helps you smooth it out. The 0.1 microfarad is very commonly used as a filtering capacitor. And then technically I also wanted to use a 10 microfarad capacitor. However, I opted to not use that and I put a bulk capacitor of 100 microfarads on the VCC of the uh, MP3 player instead. And that is because uh, the MP3 player is really the uh, only thing which will actually draw any sort of current in this circuit. And then I've just added labels on all the pins which will go out to the uh, other components. So we can uh, take a look at the power supply then. And where I have the battery, which is just uh, one uh, lithium polymer battery cell. And uh, that's also connected to the charger. I didn't have any symbols for that, so I just used the pin header symbol. And then we have the battery coming in here. And uh, this is a PFET that I'm using for the on-off switch. Because the on-off switch isn't rated uh, for enough current to uh, pass everything through it. So that's why I'm using that. And this is a change that I made from uh, the uh, original build. This was a 10 kilo ohm resistor initially. But the problem is that when the switch is on, then uh, a small amount of current will flow from the battery through that resistor to ground. And uh, that would only be about half a milliamp, but half a milliamp over time still kind of drains the battery. So I'm using a 1 mega ohm. Now 1 mega ohm is uh, a lot more sensitive to outside interference. But for this project I decided that battery life is probably better than uh, having some interference on it whenever uh, the device is uh, turned off. And if you're new to electronics you may wonder why I even have a resistor here at all. And this is because this is a P-channel MOSFET and it turns off when the gate uh, voltage is uh, similar to the source voltage. So that when the button is uh, off, then the current can flow through this one mega ohm resistor and charge up the gate. Then the current stops flowing into the gate and it also stops flowing through the P-channel MOSFET. But once it uh, goes through the P-channel MOSFET, um, I put the 3V8 symbol. And I chose the uh, 3V8 uh, symbol because that's roughly the average voltage of the uh, lithium polymer battery. iCAD has a 3V8 built in, so that's why I use that. Simple as. And then we have the uh, debug LED, and this one comes directly from one of the microcontroller pins. Now note that the microcontroller pins uh, have a limit on how much uh, current you can draw from them. But for the AT Tiny, I think that's around 30 to 40 milliamps. It's quite high for this AT Tiny, at least compared to other microcontrollers, such as the popular uh, ESP32 and uh, 8266 which I think both are uh, capped at uh, max uh, 15 milliamps. But this one allows you to drive a little bit more current than that one. And with a 1K resistor at uh, 4.2 volts, then that's 4.2 uh, milliamps that you will be uh, uh, drawing at max. And the LED itself is rated for 20 milliamps usually. But even at 4 milliamps, an LED will visually light up. And the purpose of the LED is mostly for debugging, so it doesn't really matter. It doesn't need to be that bright. And then we have the calibration button. Then when I built mine, then I skipped the 10 kilo ohm resistor and just used the, the built-in pull-up resistor in the microcontroller. Now the built-in pull-up resistor that you can enable inside the microcontroller has a much higher value. But I was running out of space and I really couldn't find a way to fit this resistor in, so I decided to uh, just use the built-in one. And essentially an input on the microcontroller is uh, like a capacitor. When it's uh, charged up, then uh, that registers as a 1. And when it's uh, discharged, then that registers as a 0. So what this does is that when the, the button is not pressed, then it's connected to 3.8 volts through the 10 kilo ohm resistor and uses that to charge up the pin. However, when the button is pressed, then the current will flow just directly to ground because uh, then this pin becomes directly shorted to ground. Now it will draw about uh, half a milliamp uh, when the button is pressed, 
but since the configuration button will only be pressed for like a second that doesn't really matter at all for the uh, power draw. So then we'll take a look at the uh, mp3 player and I'm using one of these uh, very common DF player mini modules and this is essentially just a very simple mp3 player that allows you to play mp3s off of an SD card. The way the microcontroller communicates with the mp3 player is through serial and uh, the ATtiny804 does have built-in hardware serial on uh, pin 6 and 7 but instead of connecting those over to the DF player mini I connected those to some header pin so that I could connect those to the computer and that way uh, I get some debug output from the microcontroller which made it a lot faster to develop when I could see exactly what it was doing. The ATtiny804 only has one hardware serial so what I had to do was I used pin 4 and 5 for software serial. Now the uh, TX pin coming from the uh, microcontroller to the RX pin of the DF player should use a 1 kilo ohm resistor. I'm not 100% sure why, I just followed the data sheet. So if anyone knows uh, what the purpose of that is, then feel free to post that as a comment. And because the DF player mini actually draws a fair amount of current, even when it's not playing anything, I went with the simple solution of using a P-channel MOSFET to toggle it. Now I also use a 10 kilo ohm pull-up here, but that will only affect the current draw when the DF player mini is uh, enabled and uh, it's only going to be enabled when it's uh, shouting at you so it's not really going to impact the battery life a whole lot. The gate of the MOSFET is controlled by the audio EN which uh, goes over to the uh, ATtiny microcontroller and I used a 120 ohm resistor and that's mostly a security thing in case I accidentally short something over here because it limits the amount of current that can flow from the uh, IO pin of the microcontroller. And the rest of the DF player mini is uh, pretty self-explanatory. You got the ground pins and you got the uh, speaker. Finally, let's take a look at the IR diodes that I'm using to detect if the door is open or not. And these are very common as uh, obstruction detectors. Uh, for an instance, if you enter a shop somewhere and it makes an electrical doorbell noise, then usually you can look at the door and uh, you will see something like this. Either with the emitter, which is this clear one, uh, and the uh, receiver, which is this black one, pointing towards each other uh, on the opposite ends of the door or with them sitting next to each other and usually with a reflex on the other side. And uh, the way it works is very simple. This is the emitter and uh, this is just like an ordinary LED ex except instead of sending visible light out it sends uh, infrared light out that uh, the eye can't see. And then this is uh, simply a receiver. You can essentially think of this as a resistor uh, which has its resistance lowered when it receives uh, infrared light on uh, its uh, specified frequency. So let's take a look at how these are wired. The emitter is very simple. I take power from the IR out pin and then I'm using a slightly higher value resistor than I need just so I can stay within the specs of uh, how much current I can draw from the pin and then that goes directly to ground. So that way I'm toggling it uh, just by uh, writing high or low to the IR out pin. And if you're wondering about the current draw, the input will be a maximum of uh, 4.2 volts. And then the LED will drop uh, about uh, 1.2 volts. So that leaves uh, 3 volts. And then using Ohm's law, you just divide 3 by the resistor value, which is uh, 150. Which leaves uh, 20 milliamps. And that is within the specs of the uh, ATtiny. And finally the receiver. If you've ever seen a voltage divider before it works basically the same way. So you can say, think of this as a resistor that is uh, sitting between power and between a resistor to ground and then we take a reading between the uh, IR receiver and the 10k resistor. And this is the divider bit. In this circuit I am sourcing the uh, power from one of the pins on the microcontroller which is a power saving measure because uh, if this was connected directly to uh, the battery then uh, current would flow through the diode through the uh, 10k resistor and into ground and that would add some more passive uh, current draw which I didn't want. The lower the resistance on the IR receiver the higher the voltage will be on the input which means that the more light being provided to the receiver the uh, higher the reading will be 
and when I'm doing analog reads on the uh, AT Tiny microcontroller. So what the, when I'm calibrating it, all I'm doing is uh, I'm taking a reading where I'm emitting from the emitter, bouncing that off of the uh, reflex. And the reflex is very good because uh, uh, reflexes will specifically reflect uh, light back the way that it came. And then it gets received by the receiver and then that takes a reading. And uh, if the reflex isn't present, then the reading will be much lower because uh, much less light will be reflected back into the IR. So that's how I'm detecting if the door is open or not. Anyhow, I'm going to uh, continue with the actual build video that shows the progress I went through when building this. I'm gonna warn you that the quality is pretty bad and I definitely need better lighting, uh, camera and some sort of camera mount because right now the camera is just uh, tied up to the uh, lamp itself. This is the full build video for my fridge shouting thingy. And if you only want to see the completed uh, project, then there is a different video for that, which you can go and check out. This is actually the second attempt I make, because on the uh, first attempt I connected the MP3 player backwards, which made it very difficult to solder, so... And you can't really desolder these things once you actually solder them into a perf board. But let's take a look at the uh, parts that I'm going to use. First off, uh, a charge module for the lithium polymer battery that's going to drive this. And then I'm going to use a pair of IR LEDs, one emitter and one receiver. These won't be connected to the perf board because I'm intending on 3D printing a holder for it to uh, put it into the clam tin. Uh, obviously we're going to need a clam tin to put it in. Uh, I could have 3D printed something, but uh, these clam tins have uh, proven themselves in the previous project to be pretty good housings for uh, speakers. So I'm going to use this speaker so it's uh, fairly loud. And then I will be using a perf board to put everything on. On this one I've actually cut off the sides just to uh, have it a little bit smaller profile. Because I'm going to be sticking this into the edge standing up because otherwise I won't be able to fit the speaker in. And then uh, a couple of resistors obviously. And speaking of components that you're going to be using in a lot of projects, also get yourself a batch of uh, a 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor, aka 100 nanofarad capacitors, uh, or uh, 104. Because in most projects you will be using them. I mean, not so much in this project, because I have uh, the charger and the MP3 player as modules, so these are pre-made. And you can see that uh, it has a bunch of these uh, capacitors on it. Uh, here and there, and a lot of these are going to be 0 0.1 microfarads. So they are used a lot in electronics. And I'm going to be a little bit lazy and skip the 10 microfarad capacitor here, and I will be adding a bulk capacitor of 100 microfarad to the MP3 player because the MP3 player is the uh, thing that is going to draw basically most of the current in this uh, circuit. Uh, then an LED, you know what they are used everywhere. Uh, one uh, momentary push button and this will be used for uh, the calibration so it uh, calibrates the IR LEDs. Uh, a couple of MOSFETs, P-channel, I'm going to use these AOI21357 and uh, these are completely overkill for this project uh, but they were the cheapest uh, through-hole ones that I could find on DigiKey so I'm going to use those. Uh, and then for the microcontroller, the AT Tiny 804 should do the job nicely. And because they don't come in DIP formats, I'm going to use a breakout board for this. And for the breakout board, obviously I'm going to need some pin header, probably more than that. Uh, I'll need an SD card to load up the MP3s on. And finally, I'm going to need a, a toggle button just to turn the entire thing on and off in case I want to take it out and uh, store it for some reason. Uh, and obviously I'm going to need uh, a bit of wire and just solder in general. And probably a multimeter also. Just regular tools. Anyway, let's get started. I'm going to start by soldering the uh, microcontroller to the breakout. And now, uh, I don't think you can see it on the camera, but uh, one of the sides is chamfered. And that's the left side. And if you look closely, it will also have a dot printed on it, which means that that's pin number one. So essentially, I want to put it like this. Now, I could solder this by hand, but since I'm lazy, I'm just going to... Next, I'm going to want to solder some pin header to it. Now, using a breakout board like this also has a 
useful function in that if uh, I was to start over again, like I had to do, removing the microcontroller is very easy because I can just use the hot air station to uh, remove it from the surface mount breakout. So I don't have to desolder any pins. I can just forfeit the breakout board because they're very cheap. So let's solder the MP3 player next. If you're not very familiar to this and you're wondering why I am using a PFET instead of just uh, pulling the power through the switch is because uh, the MP3 player actually draws quite a bit of current and that's going to overload the switch. The switch is only rated for milliamps. I think I'll just put the switch here in the middle. So let's take a look at the data sheet of the MOSFET. So we have a gate, drain, source. And since it's a P-channel MOSFET, we want uh, the power to come in through the source, out through the drain. Gate is gate as usual. And the switch here should toggle the uh, gate, so I'm going to put the gate close to the switch. And next, because I don't have a data sheet for the switch, I'm going to use my multimeter to uh, check for continuity. And essentially just checks if uh, the probes are shorted. Now if the switch is up, the left one and the right one are uh, connected. But if I push it down, now the middle one and the left one are connected. So essentially what I can do is uh, I can just uh, leave the right one floating and uh, the middle one connected to ground. This is the gate pin, so what I can do is I can just uh, connect across directly to the gate. However, what I want to do also on the gate pin is I want to put a resistor, 10k resistor, between the gate and the source. And then make sure that the MOSFET is turned off by default, so if uh, the switch isn't pushed uh, and pulling it down to ground, it gets pulled up to the... Uh, source voltage and turns off the MOSFET. I found that when bridging uh, the through holes like this it's easier to put solder on to the uh, tip first and then push it in as opposed to what you'd normally do. So that's the gate source pull up. Let's have some check marks on what I've done so far. I can attach the filter capacitor, just the 0.1 microfarad one which is pretty easy, you just connect it uh, between power and ground on the microcontroller. Actually, to save space on the board, I think I'm just going to be a little bit sneaky. I'm going to connect it directly to the breakout board. I'll be responsible and I'll use the tweezers. It's not as pretty, but it does save space. I'm going to put a little red mark here, because source is supposed to come in here, which is from the battery. And drain is uh, the middle pin, which should be connected uh, up here to the power input of the microcontroller. Because the microcontroller should always be hooked up to the battery, except for when the, uh, the button isn't pressed. I'm going to be lazy here too and just do a quick solder directly onto the pin. And then while I'm at it, might as well do the same thing for the other MOSFET, which is uh, turning on and off the power to the MP3 player. Because uh, the passive power drain, also known as the quiescent current of the uh, MP3 player, is pretty high. So I'm just going to do it the easy way by uh, turning it on and off with a MOSFET, P-channel MOSFET. It means technically I should just be able to put it like this, and then bridge across here in the middle. Uh, because the drain of the input MOSFET here is uh, outputting the power from the battery whenever the button is pushed. And we can just forward that uh, to the input of the uh, MOSFET that controls the MP3 player. So I need to bridge uh, across here. And then I can connect the other two pins while I'm at it. There we go. And this one is also going to need a MOSFET between the uh, source and the gate. 
to make sure it's off by default. You might be wondering if uh, putting a resistor up against the heat sink is such a good idea. But rest assured that these things are specced to handle up to like uh, 70 amps. And this uh, circuit is going to be pulling like uh, maybe half an amp at max. So uh, it's going to stay cool as a cucumber. A phrase I only use because of Cadgar. Let's see here. Yes. I need to bridge across here. And now the top left here is the power pin. Which means I need to go from the center and go across and into the power pin there. But before I do that, I think I'm going to put the uh, big bulk capacitor on. I think I'll put the bulk capacitor here. And then I'll connect the ground later. Actually, what I could do here is just create a little makeshift power rail. This will save me a little bit of solder. I'll hook it up to the drain, the MOSFET. And now it's connected to the power pin. I think I'm going to do a dirty here and just connect the, uh, the button off board and <laughs> use some glue or something to, to put it in because I'm running out of space. Now the button itself is uh, fairly straightforward, it has a 10k pull up and then it's connected uh, directly to the uh, uh, calibration pin which is on number 12, 12 which is up here. Now uh, normally I would have put a 10k res pull up resistor on the calibration button, however I am kind of running out of space on this board so what I think I'm going to do here is I'm just going to be lazy and use the uh, internal pull up resistor that the microcontroller has. And uh, it's, it's not a strong pull up, but uh, it should be good enough for at least for, for this one off project. If I was to do this, however, on uh, like a proper printed circuit board, then I would definitely use a uh, proper pull up resistor. But that means that the uh, button only needs to be uh, connected to ground and up to the uh, uh, pin number 12. So let's just uh, connect it to pin number 12 and I will put an exclamation point next to the ground because I haven't actually connected much ground yet. I think I'm going to connect uh, the grounds last. The camera bugged out but uh, I've connected the uh, yellow wire here to, the, uh, to one of the pins on the button. And now I'm going to connect the other end over to the uh, physical pin 12. Next up, I guess I could attach the LED, which is just a debug LED. It goes on pin, physical pin 2. And that should have a 1 kilo ohm resistor. I mean, it's only going to give it about 3.8 or so milliamps, but it still should be bright enough. I'll cut off the ground lead for now. Uh, what I am going to do is also I'm going to swap the uh, resistor and the LED positions. It doesn't matter where it sits. So I'm going to have the uh, resistor coming in on the anode instead of the cathode. I just have to sit on the back. Because I am very cramped for space. So next up I think it's time to start adding some connectors. I'll leave the other side of this unconnected for now. So remember to connect this later. So I get some red wire to connect that up. That is pin IR out is on physical pin 9.
So this would be for the IR output. Essentially I just put the uh, output dial on like so. But it's going to have to be uh, connected through some sort of 3D print. But then these two are going to have to be off the board so I'll just leave that as a socket and then move on. So uh, where we're powering the input through an I.O. pin to save some uh, extra power while it's uh, just idling because otherwise it's going to uh, go through the IR receiver and through the 10k resistor to the ground permanently and it uh, it might not sound like a lot because it's like a 20k resistor but that's still uh, over a long period of time that's still just going to discharge the battery so it's better to just have a pin drive this entire thing so uh, I might put that up here too which means I need a 10 kilo ohm resistor to ground. I might just make this entire strip here ground. So that was the resistor attached, and then there should be like a three way junction which connects to the uh, cathode of the IR receiver, and also one that goes to the IR input pin. So uh, the IR input pin, let's start with that then. It is on physical pin 8, which is down here, so I need to put a wire from that one up there. I probably didn't do myself any favors by going with a board this small. I should learn to start etching my own surface mount stuff. But I'm not sure if that would take longer or not. Do an ugly connection like that because I'm running out of pins up there. So anyway, the anode should be connected uh, so it's like this, because when you're using one of these uh, IR receivers you, you want to connect it in reverse so you have the power coming in on the uh, cathode. So that's essentially going to be connected like that, and then that should be connected to IR in EN, which is on uh, physical 13, which is uh, up here. And technically that's used to supply power, so I'm going to use some red. And then that one needs to go all the way up there. Now what I'm thinking about doing here... Is I might put some header pin on. Because it's going to make testing a bit easier later. And also so as I remember that I connected these up here. So for an instance this one is for the, uh, this one was for the emitter. And this one would be for the receiver. Not a pretty solder but it should work. I think I'll just uh, connect this ground here immediately now. I'll draw a little marking and just do an E here. That's the anode. So let's attach the final data pins, which will be to the uh, DF player, and then we'll hook up grounds and uh, power. Time to hook up the uh, DF player. So the TX pin needs a one kilo ohm resistor, which means I'm going to have to put a resistor down there. I'll just lazily solder it directly to the pin. And from there, we need some yellow. Should go all the way across to pin four. I might go with the lazy solution here again to save space. Next, we need the uh, RX pin to the TX pin of the MP3 player, which is on the physical five to physical three. It's made a little bit difficult with my camera. It's currently rigged up to my lamp. Said lamp also has the magnifying glass. So I'm gonna have to do this one quite far away, which is a little bit annoying. But anyway, I'm just gonna go put a lot of solder on there so I can do the same lazy thing with just soldering it directly to the pin. It doesn't look good, but it should work. So the next thing here I think will be to connect speaker, and I think what I will do is I will use uh, some pin header for that too. And there's one th more thing that I probably want to connect to the uh, microcontroller, which is a breakout for UPDI that I can use for programming. 
So let's see, the speaker will have to be uh, down here somewhere. Doesn't really matter where I put it. Just put it there in the middle, will be slightly easier to connect to. It's not even gonna look well, but it should work. And the speaker, if I recall correctly, should be down here. So we have one here, one here. So let's use some red for this one. I'm gonna try not to burn any of the other wires with the soldering iron. Because I don't feel like re-soldering them. And then let's get some black wire. So let's start connecting some grounds then. Uh, another thing I probably want to do is put on some pin header for the battery. Uh, I'm just going to mark the pin header so this will be the speaker so I'll draw an S and then I'll just put the battery down here I think. Yeah that should work. So let's see here. So now the battery comes in here, goes into the source pin of the PFET, and out through the drain pin, which is in the middle. So now what I have left to do, other than adding uh, UPDI, is to add uh, is to connect everything to ground. And I have a few uh, pins free here that I can connect to ground. Let's see here. So how about I start here with the uh, MP3 player? It's ground down here. And it needs to go diagonally across. I'm hoping that this can deliver enough current for the speaker, <clears throat> but I guess that's what the bulk capacitor is for. Since the speaker will spike current quite a lot. I've had issues with that before. Where I wasn't getting enough current to the speaker. And then was just shutting down. If I can't, uh, if I'm starting to have power issues, then I, I'm probably also going to replace this pin header with a, an actual soldered one, just to get a much better connection. Anyhow, it's a little bit long, but it doesn't matter if there's some spaghetti on the back side. Uh, next, I need to connect the bottom ground. I need a tiny piece of black wire. Oops, that's not my, this isn't my solder. I just hook up the button ground down to the uh, speaker ground then. So that's the button ground. And next, the debug LED needs to also can be connected to the ground. And believe it or not, I think I'm just going to connect that also over to the uh, to the speaker ground. So I can just connect that one also in parallel directly to the battery ground. So next up, I think I just need to connect ground to the uh, microcontroller itself. And in order to do that, I'm just going to add a very quick bridge here. Now one useful thing to do is also to check uh, if you have a short between uh, power and ground, which I do not have. That's always a good thing to check before plugging anything in. And I should also check after the uh, PFET. Uh, let's see here, it's on this capacitor. No I, no, I do not have one. So that's always good. Means it shouldn't catch fire at least. Okay, so one more thing. I want a little bit more pin header. Just to make a little breakout to uh, connect it for programming. And the UPDI on this is on pin number 10. So 8, 9, 10. Uh, that's going to be a little bit annoying to solder. Oh, this is dumb, but I'll improvise. And finally the TX pin, so I can listen into it. And uh, well, I mean, it might as well uh, also attach RX in case I want to send some data to it uh, in the future. I probably won't, but uh, it it should be easier to solder one of these two pins. This is also not the best way of doing it, but um, especially if it falls out. So 
So let's take a look at uh, if I missed anything. And I can immediately see that I missed the uh, audio enable. So let's just start with that. Since I routed pin 2 on the inside, I should be able to, uh, I should be fine to just uh, go down directly to pin 2. And using uh, that hole instead. So this is a 120 ohm uh, uh, resistor for the gate. Technically it's not needed but in case I mess something up, I've done that in the past, uh, I might break the microcontroller if I accidentally short the pin otherwise. So, it's more of a just in case thing. This should be a pretty short route, I just need to go around and uh, put it up uh, here maybe. Now I'm just going to do a quick test of the microcontroller to see if the pins on that one are uh, connected correctly. So we got power obviously, first pin, uh, we should go to the drain of this MOSFET. Yep, the drain is connected to the uh, heatsink. While I'm at it, might as well check ground because ground is pretty easy to check. So that's good. And then we have pin 2, which is to the LED. So I can check uh, that one actually goes through a resistor to the LED. So, But I can see that it's connected there. And that the LED should be connected to ground. On the cathode, which is correct. So then we have uh, pin number 3 which is the audio enable and that goes to, to this uh, resistor and then the said resistor should go to the gate of uh, this MOSFET and the gate is on the left yep that's correct so then we take a look at uh, pin number 4 which is uh, TX should go to the uh, 1k resistor on the TX pin goes over here, yeah, and then the resistor should be connected uh, to the TX pin, yep, or rather to the RX pin, I mean. And then we have the uh, pin number 5, which I do believe is the RX, yep, connected. The 6 and 7 are just connected directly to the uh, pin header, which will be used for debugging. So we go to number 8, which is the IR input, and that should be uh, one of these, that should be the receiver. Okay, so here is a missing connection that I found, that I forgot to solder over the resistor to the... Uh, so the resistor here should have been a three-way junction, right now it just goes uh, in through the resistor into ground, it should also be connected to the pin header. So that's one that I forgot, so it's uh, always good to... So this is why it's always good to um, test everything before you connect it to your uh, computer. Or just connect it in general, so you, you minimize the chances of setting a fire. Ow. There we go, slightly better. So now it's connected. So here I noticed that I also didn't connect this one up to the pin. Uh, pin number pin number nine should have been connected up to this uh, pin up here on the, the anode, but it's not. So well, that's another fix I'll need to do. Yep, now it's connected. Number 12 should go to the calibration button, which is thus. Number 13, the final one, is the IR enable, which enables the IR reading, which should just go to the uh, uh, anode of the uh, receiver, which should be up here. Yep. And at this point, I should be able to plug it into a computer and program it. So uh, let's just do that and see if I can actually get it to work. So let's prepare the external parts. For the IR diode, I've uh, 3D printed this part. I'm going to use the back of it because it's flat. And basically use a permanent marker and make sure there's a lot of uh, marker on there. Uh, 
and then quickly before it sets, I put it down into the uh, container and just push real hard. And then gently remove it. And now this marking might not be entirely accurate, but it should be good enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill some holes in these and use that as the output for the sensor. But before I do that, let's prepare the uh, rest of the stuff. So we're going to need the speaker, obviously. And for that I'm going to use some more flexible wiring. So I'll get a bit of solder on the wire. Now this wire is a bit, bit overkill, but it's uh, what I had at home, so... Let's get some glue on there also to uh, help isolate it a little bit better. It's not going to look good, but it's going to be sitting inside of the jar, so... Now I'm going to use this old uh, 1200 milliamp hour battery. Uh, it's kind of old and worn, but trust me, it is uh, 1200 milliamp hours. Something that you want to take into consideration when you're buying these cheap charge modules, TP4056 ones, is that uh, the resistor is set uh, to charge these at uh, 1 amp. So if you're using a, a lithium battery rated below 1 amp hour and you try to charge it with this, then uh, you're probably going to notice some swelling and in the worst case an explosion. So. Uh, make sure you go above one amp hour if you're gonna use this. Either that or you can replace this resistor here with something with a higher value and that will slow down the charge rate. Uh, this one in particular also has uh, a battery protection circuit which isn't strictly needed because my uh, lithium battery already has one built in. Uh, but uh, I had a bunch of these at home so it doesn't matter. Uh, the only thing you need to keep in mind is that uh, Whereas battery positive and out positive are connected, uh, battery minus and out minus is not. But because the uh, battery minus is toggled by this MOSFET and is turned off if a fault like an overcharge or an undercharge is detected. Now this one already has some solder on the uh, battery negative pin so I'm just gonna treat it like a pad. Next I need some wire for the battery. Since the battery isn't going to move after I've attached it, I can just use some of this wire. And then before I do anything else, I'm just going to test and see if it works. Push the start button. And nothing. Oh, there we go. And there we go, now it turns on. However, nothing's going to happen because I haven't plugged in the speaker yet. And also, it's going to take down in 30 seconds. So let's see, where's the speaker? It's down here. Four, three, two, one. Calibration failed. Oh. Please try again. This is the calibration message. So at least I know the speaker works and the power works. However, we can't calibrate it because we don't have the uh, IR sensors on yet. But before we do that, I'm gonna just make it a little bit more resilient by adding some glue. Should prevent the cables from breaking too. There's gonna be a lot of glue in this video. And while this glue is setting, I'm going to go and drill a hole in this. I have made some holes. Now because this thing won't sit exactly tight to it, it might be uh, reflecting a little bit back. So what I'm going to do here, so I'm going to take my black permanent marker. Though I guess it's kind of bluish. But anyway, in something dark. And just make sure that the edges are lined so that the clam jar doesn't uh, reflect back and give false positives. Uh, 
There we go. Next up, I need to do the same thing by adding some pin socket to each of the uh, diodes. So I've uh, cut a hole in this and uh, I've cut a little bit uh, longer because I didn't uh, line it up perfectly. I'll cut them diagonally. Just so I remember the uh, cathode and anode. It's not perfect, but it doesn't have to be perfect. And now if I push these in, I use a screwdriver to push them in a little bit further. And then I can connect these. So let's see here, the receiver is the dark one, so that's the one I'm holding right now. The anode is on the left. Miller has the anode on the right. So basically how it works is I have this uh, reflective tape. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it on. And then I'm going to push the button to calibrate it. Please close the fridge now. Calibrating and then hold in five, the tape before four, it. Three, two, one. Calibration successful. And now it's being calibrated. So if I hold up the uh, reflex in front of it, then the LED turns off. So this will be when the fridge is uh, closed. But then I simulate opening the fridge by removing the reflex tape. And then you wait 30 seconds and it should be playing the uh, audio. This is disgusting! And there we go. After uh, 30 seconds it should cut power to the mp3 player in order to uh, save on the battery. After doing a few more tests on the idle current draw of the circuit I found an issue and uh, it's the pull up resistor for the uh, on off switch which was 10k which uh, would cause it to draw uh, 500 micrograms which might not sound like a lot but it's uh, still large enough to make uh, an impact on uh, the battery length so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to be lazy here and put a 1 mega ohm resistor instead of the 10k resistor uh, while testing I have also desoldered the uh, connection over to the mp3 player so it shouldn't get any power at this point but that's just because I'm trying to power optimize this as much as possible right now to make sure it doesn't d discharge the battery in like a few days or, or like uh, just a month. Uh, I'm wanting this to, to last for like uh, maybe 5-6 months at least uh, without a recharge. What I've done here is uh, I've connected uh, a pin on the positive end of the battery. So I'm going to connect the negative. And then I'm going to use the uh, 200 milliamp setting. And I've also uploaded a, a debug sketch that turns everything off just to see how much uh, current is going to draw. Just so I know that I get the hardware right. Okay, I can go to 20 milliamp mode. Okay, we have about uh, somewhere around 60 microamps, which should be fine. Let's glue. Now I can start thinking about connecting everything up to the jar. I think I'm going to use some super glue. I just coat the front, and then I'm just going to push it in. And this will actually take a little while, so I'm just going to sit here. This is a bit lazy, but what I did was uh, the same as I did before. I used a uh, permanent marker to draw on the speaker and then I just pushed it down onto the lid. And next I just gotta cut it. I'm probably gonna have to cut a little bit extra off. I think uh, last time I did this I uh, used screws on it but I think it would be prettier maybe to just glue it in. So I'm gonna do the thing with the super glue and the hot glue again.
There we go, I'm going to let that sit. Next I'm going to want to put the circuit in somehow, which means to save a little bit of space I'm going to cut these pins off. Well, let's get some glue on both sides and then just stick them in. This should also protect the wires from breaking, but I'm not going to be able to do any more soldering on this after this. Doesn't really matter where I put it. Definitely not the prettiest solution, but it should be good enough for this project. Now, uh, lithium batteries and the heat aren't exactly the best friends, so I'm not going to glue that. So uh, I'm probably just going to glue up here on the top and not on the actual battery part. And then I'll glue in the uh, charger. And I'll probably put that on the opposite end. Just to make it a little bit more balanced. And then I think I'll just glue on the tape here. So I don't overheat the battery. I've turned off the power now to the... Uh, hot glue gun so it's gonna get a little bit cooler a little bit less melty now that I have because I do wanna put a little bit of glue here on the back of the battery I can do a little bit at a time and it won't get too hot there we go it's uh, solidifying much faster now and now I'm just gonna let this sit for a little while and then I will uh, connect everything together at this point I glued everything together and as you can see, it uh, does work, it does sense. So essentially how it works is uh, you hold down the uh, configuration button. Please close the fridge now. And then that configures it based on the distance five, to the reflector. Four, three, two, calibration successful. So that was a successful calibration, which means that if I move this one further away, it turns on closer and it turns off. So at this point I should be fine to close this. And then we can try. This is disgusting! Do you have any standards? I think as a final touch I'm going to put some black silicone around this. There we go, a little bit better. Please close the fridge now. Calibrating in five, four, three, two, one. Calibration successful. Are you always this pathetic? Smell that! 